Welcome to the Beverly Unitarian Church Online Worship. My name is Greg Lawler. I usually serve with music roles in the church, but today I'm going to be the worship associate. I'm so glad to welcome you to worship today. We are a Unitarian Universalist congregation of children, youths, and adults of many races, religions, secular identities, genders, sexual orientations, abilities, educations, incomes, and traditions. Here we celebrate a diversity of beliefs, striving always to make space for more. All of you is sacred. You are welcome here. Whatever your past or present is like, we invite you to walk into the future with us. Like other Unitarian Universalist congregations, we affirm seven principles, which are not doctrine or dogma, but rather our shared values and moral guide. To learn more about these principles, please visit the website of our denomination, www.uua.org. Our minister is the Reverend David Schwartz. Today, we are fortunate to have as a guest speaker, the Reverend Lucas Hergert. Reverend Hergert has been a minister since 2009, currently serving the North Shore Unitarian Church in Deerfield, Illinois. He grew up in a Unitarian Universalist congregation in Cincinnati, Ohio, and first heard his call to the ministry in high school. He has an undergraduate degree in philosophy from Miami University, Master of Divinity from Harvard Divinity School, and a Doctor of Ministry from the Pacific School of Religion. Lucas was also previously a college faculty member teaching courses in philosophy and comparative religion. His interests include yoga, Shakespeare plays, Viking, continental philosophy, fantasy movies, interfaith work, and humor. We especially welcome visitors and hope you'll stay for the virtual coffee hour after the service on Zoom using the link that will be shared in the chat. We look forward to the day when we will be able to meet you in person. Due to the coronavirus, we are forced to distance ourselves physically, but we can stay connected. In addition to our Sunday worship, we have several groups who gather by phone or Zoom, both for, both for community and for church business. To get more involved, check out, out our web, Facebook page and our website. Contact the office to sign up for a monthly newsletter and weekly Friday email blast, and to be connected to Reverend David for pastoral care. And now, let us join together in spirit and prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Beverly Unitarian, good morning. It is so nice to be with you today. My name is Lucas Hergert. I'm the minister of the North Shore Unitarian Church in Deerfield, Illinois. And today I am broadcasting from our sanctuary. Um, it's really a treat to get to do this pulpit exchange. I'm so grateful to the Reverend uh, David Schwartz for inviting me uh, to do this exchange with him. Now, normally when I do an exchange, I get to meet the congregation, I, I get to meet the people, I get to hear about uh, what it is that you love about your church, and I just want to say I'm, I'm sad that I'm not able to be there in person with you today. Uh, but nonetheless, this is an hour that I have been looking forward to. I am really grateful for all of your warm hospitality in this invitation. Let's worship together. Greetings. Today, I'm going to light the chalice of the North Shore Unitarian Church 
in order to begin our service. And by way of some opening words, I offer these from Laurel Sheridan. Take from life its coals and not its ashes. Fan the flames of love and justice. Join hands and hearts in this common endeavor. And then, if we do that, there will be no limit to what we can accomplish together. My spiritual companions, welcome to this day in this place. chosen to be the reader this week and today I'll be reading Frederick. All along the meadow where the cows grazed and the horses ran there was an old stone wall. In that wall not far from the barn and the gurney, a chattery family of field mouse had their home. But the farmers had moved away, the barn was abandoned, and the gurney stood empty. And since winter was not too far off, the little mice began to gather corn and nuts and wheat and straw. They all worked day and night, all except Frederick. Frederick, why don't you work, they asked. I do work, said Frederick. I gather the sun rays for the cold, dark winter days. 
And when they saw Frederick sitting there, staring at the meadow, they said, And not Frederick. I gather colors, answered Frederick simply, for the winter is gray. And once Frederick seemed half asleep. Are you dreaming, Frederick? They asked repro reproachfully. But Frederick said, oh no, I am gathering words, for the winter days are long and many, and will run out of things to say. The winter days came, and when the first snow fell, the five little field mice took to their hideout in the stones. In the beginning, there was lots to eat, and the mice told story of foolish fox, foxes and silly cats. They were a happy family. But little by little, they had nibbled up most of the nuts and berries. The straw was gone and the corn was only a memory. It was cold in their walls and no one felt like chatting. Then they remembered what Frederick had said about the sun rays and colors and words. What about your supplies, Frederick, they asked. Close your eyes, said Frederick, as he climbed on the big stone. Now I send you the rays of sun. Do you feel their golden glow? And as Frederick spoke of the sun, the four little mice began to feel warm. Was it Frederick's voice? Was it magic? And how about the colors, Frederick, they asked anxiously. Close your eyes again, Frederick said. And when he told them about the blue periwinkles and the red poppies and the yellow wheat, the green leaves of the blueberry bush, they saw the colors as clear as if they had been painting in their mind. And the words, Frederick? Frederick cleared his throat, waited a moment, and then as if from a stage, Frederick said, who scatters snowflakes? Who melts the ice? Who spoils the weather? Who makes it nice? Who grows the four leaf clovers in June? Who dims in the daylight? Who lights the moon? Four little field mice who had lived in the sky. Four little field mice like you and I. One, in, one is the spring mouse who turns on the showers then comes summer who paints in the flowers. The fall mouse is next with walnuts and wheat and winter is last with little cold feet. Aren't we lucky the seasons are four? Think of the year with one less or one more. When Frederick had finished, they all, when Frederick had finished, they all applauded. But Frederick, they said, you are a poet. Frederick blushed took a bow and said shyly, I know it. The end. Thank you. We come together each week as a community, whether we're doing this in person or remotely as we're doing right now. This gives us an opportunity to sit together, to meditate together for those who do to pray together, and also to share our lives whether it's sharing our joys, our concerns, even our sorrows. In a moment, we'll have an opportunity to share uh, what you wish to share with the congregation in the chat box. But let us first sit for a moment in meditation. And I would like to read the words of what's often called the Prayer of St. Francis, although it's actually a much more modern prayer, not at all due to St. Francis. Make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. Grant that I, be, that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, 
for it is in giving that we receive, and it's in pardoning that we are pardoned. And now I will ask you to share what you wish with the community using the chat box, but remembering that this is a public forum. If you wish to express something, but you don't want to uh, say it in detail, feel free to do the typesetting version of what we do in church. In church, we do this, the two fingers. Typesetting, we can type two eyes as, as if you were doing that. And before doing that, I will light one candle, which will represent all our joys and concerns. reading this morning comes from Philippe Petit. He was, um, of course, the famous tightrope walker who strung a wire between the World Trade Centers uh, back in the early 70s and uh, walked back and forth between them eight times. These are some of his words. Life. Life should be lived on the edge. You have to exercise rebellion, to refuse to tape yourself to rules, to refuse your own success, to refuse to repeat yourself, to see every day, every year, every idea as a true challenge. And then, and only then, are you going to live your life as though on a tightrope. So ends the reading. <laughs> Classmates announced the school's recess by kicking a white ball to excited yelps and serious commands. A younger student in a polka dotted skirt swings on a tire that moans every time it shifts left across from an older student sulking in black denim by a flag pole. Under a tree, raining down blooms of pink snow, my friend, who is all blonde, bowl cut, and delayed orthodontic work, shortens his step, reduces the width, sticks his arms out, tries to find a perfect straight line. He steps on this rusted black metal railing between cement posts, working it like a tightrope. He shifts and concentrates. He tries to find the plumb line down the center of his body, falling and landing on the cushion of his sneakers with a soft thud. And here I am, all Coke bottle glasses and awkward limbs, climbing onto the starting post. But before I even get one foot on the bar, a teacher catches my eye. She scribbles a forbidding look all over her face. Stop. Not safe. I get down, deflated. 
Now, it will be several more months before my friend and I are able to test our metal again. Humid Midwest August have more festivals and fairs than they do mosquitoes. The Catholic parish near my home sets out its enormous sign announcing food, entertainment, and prizes. Its paint of primary colors has been reapplied so many times that the clown image on the sign possesses the creepy realism of caked on makeup. I find little thrill in games of balloon darts for teddy bears disemboweled of their stuffing. That is not the festival that I plan to take my friend to. Instead, I see them setting it up. A few towns away in the parking lot of a school, two towers rise. Their platforms are at least three stories in the air. This new monstrosity looms over the standard tilt-a-whirl and booths where families will slurp sweating snow cones. I thrill to see the workman threading a steel serpent between the pillars and then affixing a bike with a huge weight that forces it to stay upright. Could this really be a ride? A ride where the object is not to fall in controlled roller coaster fashion, but rather to balance precariously? It's perfect for my 11-year-old imagination. That spring, I complete a report on Philippe Petit. He becomes an international inspiration when, in 1974, he rigs a cable between the World Trade Centers and saunters back and forth eight times, playing to crowds below so distant that they look like dust. His walk is graceful and death-defying. As he approaches the South Tower, Police officers rush to the ledge. They coax, plead, and threaten. But apparently neither promise nor threat have gravity at that altitude. My friend and I escape our parental chaperones into the crowd, swimming past booths through families to our destination. Competing calliope music spirals from the Ferris wheels and tilt-a-whirls, we pass a tense sporting languid goldfish in blue-tinted cups, sidling up to a garbage can, wafting the remains of unswallowed beer. We find the entrance to the ride. An unwelcoming teenage vendor, all rail-thin and facial piercings, holds a roll of tickets. Next to him is another sign that appears as inhospitable as he does, no riders under this height. There is absolutely no doubt that my friend and I are under that height. None. So in spontaneous synchronization, we try to act tall, imagining our spines extending periscopically. It's not convincing, but for some strange reason, some inscrutable reason, the boy smirks and gives us a ticket anyway. We cannot believe our luck. We stand triumphant. We have overcome the arbitrary constraints of adults. But behind, a young woman in cutoff shorts, snorting at her date's treacherously bad jokes in the long winding line, some small soft part of me regrets this. A spot inside my chest is already turning to mush. Overhead, the oppressive friction of the bike against the steel cable drains my courage. One part of me wants nothing more than to leave my friend for the teddy bear games in this carnival line inexplicably turned into a foxhole. I start to pray for adult intervention. I guess I'm used to adults chiding, commanding, chaperoning, corralling. Of course, I sometimes break away from their prison guard watch and climb too high into the neighborhood oak tree or jaywalk when they aren't looking. But usually, I expect them to rush in, 
to curtail unreasonable aspirations and serious dangers. I am just starting to see the rim of a world whose chaos is untamed by parental sky gods, a world where I can choose heights at which they cannot help or assist and where the ground can suddenly drop. The philosopher Soren Kierkegaard defined faith this way. He said that faith is living with profound uncertainty as though one were suspended over 70,000 fathoms of water. Now, that's not exactly a tightrope, but it is equally precarious. When we are confronted with such vulnerability and precarity, we are certainly warranted in feeling fearful and anxious. We might worry ourselves all day over what we will lose. Kierkegaard says that the only alternative is faith. We can find faith is trust. We can trust the next step on the wire, even as we know that we are risking danger. What does this mean to live a faithful response in this moment? I believe that we are being called as people of faith, as Unitarian Universalists, to risk deeper and sustained action around racism and white supremacy. We are being called to look at the ways insidious patterns and beliefs have seeped into our lives and shaped our culture. For white people, it is going to take leaning deeply into our discomfort around whiteness in ways that our parents may not have empowered us to do and find a recognition that we have unacknowledged internal racism to work on. We have to do this if we are ever to challenge the brutality and the violence that we see in our world. My spiritual companions, I get it. This is scary stuff. It can feel a whole lot like the ground is dropping out from under us. These steps can feel uncomfortable and vulnerable, but I also know I also believe, I also have a firm conviction that those steps are precisely the ones that are necessary. However risky it feels to me as a white person to engage in this work, I just remind myself that the drop is that much deadlier for a person of color. Failing to take the risk and instead choosing to stay with comfort and silence, choosing to look away from the conversation, choosing not to engage in all the hurt and pain that we see in our world, those don't even seem like options to me anymore. It just wouldn't be right. And so I'm ready. Stepping onto the slotted metallic platform, it's my turn. An indifferent operator in brown overall straps me into a loosely fitted woven belt. Suspended three stories above the churning crowd, I clamp down on the handles. My knuckles turn pale. A kaleidoscope circles on my thick lenses. Squeals from games and arguments and laughter reach the platform like the distant prayers of supplicants. They are millions of miles away. I am the one pushing forward, full of rebellion and conviction, discovering this strange, new, precarious footing. My spiritual companions, may you discover those next steps in grace. Amen. And blessings. And thank you so much for your hospitality this morning. Oh
while I run this race. For I don't want to run this race in vain. Hold my hand while I run this race. Hold my hand while I run this race. Hold my hand while I run this race. For I don't want to run this race in vain. Stand. My spiritual companions, by way of closing, I invite you to think about the question, what would it mean for you today to take a few steps out onto that tightrope? How might you find a few more steps out into faith? How might you carry your values more deeply into the world? How might you find some more steps towards love and towards hope and towards justice? The world needs that right now. It needs people who are willing to take the risk and take the walk. May we go forth and find that courage. Amen and blessed be. Please join me in saying the words as we extinguish our chalice. We extinguish the chalice here that it might shine on in our hearts. May it light our path as we leave this place. May it guide our way until we are together again.